Good morning. If if you are visiting with us and this is your first time, you can come to that lunch here and uh, after our class, uh, first or second timers, or you have never been to one and you'd like to go to one, that's fine. Last week, I introduced uh, a, les- a lesson on introduction to the book of Revelation. Uh, if you're visiting with us, thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you come again. Uh, we enjoy studying the scripture, and uh, right now we're in uh, the end times, and we'll be here for a while uh, still. We've been on it for a year and a half, a year so we'll be on it for another year. Uh, so we got a lot to cover, and we will we will do that. But today, uh, last week, I had, we had an introductory st- lesson on the Book of Revelation, and I said at the time that I'm going to have three different re- introductions to the Book of Revelation, and <clears throat> each of them looking at the Book of Revelation from a different standpoint. And last week's was really kind of basic how we can understand the Book of Revelation. Uh, some hints on how to interpret uh, the uh, symbols that are used in the book of Revelation, knowing that every symbol that's found in the book of Revelation is found someplace else in the Bible. Things like that was in last week's lesson. Today is going to be different and uh, from a different standpoint. And it's going to be about finding Jesus in the book of Revelation. Because it is, after all, called a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the very first words that we find in our English Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Last week, I gave you a teaser. I showed you this. I said, in order to understand it, you're going to have to come back today. And I'm glad you're here. Uh, What I want you to do is look at, this is the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, it's got the the Hebrew on on top. Hebrew reads and writes from right to left, not not like we are in English from left to right. So what I wanted you to do is, is to look at the fourth word and see that there's no translation for it. And I said, oh, do you know what that is? How many actually tried to find this? One. I, I'm glad somebody looked at it and, and uh, tried to figure out what it is. There have been many different... Uh, by the way, I, I mentioned last week, that word is found in the scripture 7,000 times, more than 7,000 times in the Old Testament. And it's never translated in our English translations. So why is it there? Well, one person puts this. They say it's a literary, it's literally a literary gramma- or grammatical function to mark the object of what is being spoken of. So maybe that's not a word then. Maybe it's a grammatical structure. However, you can, you can actually, I don't know if you did this uh, when you're trying to find this, if you, if you went out on the internet and you just put in the two letters in the way we would spell them in English, I'll give you those two letters in just a minute, uh, you would find all kinds of reports on them in, in, in the, on the Internet. Another person have, has come up with this, and many Jews believe this, that rather than just being a mark of a grammatical structure, they've come out and said, well, let me first give you the letters. The letters are Aleph and Tav, reading from right to left. Olive and Tav. Now, if you look at those two letters, 
As I mentioned, the internet, you find all kinds of stuff. Other people in the Jewish community believe that it, it's there to signify their coming Messiah, our risen Lord. Why would they do that? And what has this got to do with the introduction to the book of Revelation? Well, let me ask you another question. In the book of Revelation, how did Christ often identify himself? As what? Yes. First and last. Where, where? I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. These two letters are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And there is the Greek. And this is why they've come up with the idea that maybe this is talking about he who is all complete, all-inclusive. And uh, so you have some uh, theologians within the Jewish community that go along this line. Well, of course, we as Christians believe that he is already, to us, Alpha and Omega. Why not Aleph Tav as well? Because it really says the same thing, the beginning and the end, or the first and the last. And that's uh, all I'm going to say about that teaser I gave you last week. Is, uh, but you can go out and look at all of Tav in, in, in the internet and you'll find all kinds of information. It's just the very first time that Jesus speaks in the book of Revelation is verse 8 of chapter 1, where he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then just in the last very last chapter of the book of Revelation, we find in chapter 22, verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And we find it many times in between the, those two uh, bookends. <clears throat> we know that scripture in the New Testament talks about how that, Jesus talks about how the Old Testament speaks often of him. And we find it in Luke, the tw- 24th chapter, in verse 27, <clears throat> and beginning of Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures things concerning himself. And then a few verses later, we find when he said, then he said to them, "These are the words which I spoke to you while we are still, while I was still with you, that you know." <clears throat> that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the laws of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So again, Jesus is saying, you look at the Old Testament, it speaks often to me, and it really does, it speaks often to him. Even without this talif of, uh, it speaks often of Jesus Christ. But if that's added another 7,000 times, that's, that's interesting. It is, after all, a revelation of Jesus Christ, this book that we're now studying a little bit. We'll have another introductory lesson next week, looking at it from an entirely different uh, angle than this one or last one. If your Bible is like mine, the heading for this book of Revelation is called The Revelation of St. Of John, uh, of John the Divine, uh, make sure I got it right. The Revelation of John the Divine. Uh, I think that's a, a misnomer, for this is actually a revelation of Jesus Christ. John was the writer, he was not the author, the author came from God, and uh, so this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ is the grand theme throughout all the Bible. And also here in the, in the book of Revelation. Uh, so today we're going to focus on what does the book of Revelation say about Jesus himself? 26 times 
The book of Revelation shows him to be the sacrificial lamb. Calls him the lamb 26 times in the book of Revelation. The book is really full of him. Just like the rest of the Bible, the Messiah shows up over and over again in this book. Because Jesus is the central theme of all the Bible. And as one person put it, history is his story. Let me begin with the writings of Moses and go all the way through. If you you begin with the writings of Moses and go all the way through the book of Revelation, you'll find Jesus over and over again. I'm I'm reemphasizing that over and over again because Jesus is the central focus of the Bible, no matter if you're in the Old or New Testament. Jesus is identified many different ways in the book of Revelation. Some of you weren't here when we started this class back up after the pandemic. We started this class in September of 2021. And now we're going for about a year and a half. And I said in the very first lesson that in my studies uh, and my reading of the Bible during the pandemic, one day I was reading the first chapter of the book of Revelation, and I got so enamored by the many titles it gave to Jesus Christ, I kept reading it for an entire month, and eventually put it to memory. But uh, let me show you the different ways in which Jesus is shown by different titles, different descriptors in the book of Revelation. He's called the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. These are all in the first chapter. I I didn't put chapter and verse on your screen there. I do in my notes. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. The one who was and who is and who is to come. He is the Almighty. He is the first and the last. He is the Son of Man. And he is who lives. Those are all in the first chapter. Continuing. He is who holds the seven stars in his hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. He's the sharp two-edged sword. He's the son of God. He who has the eyes like a flame of fire. I think that's the end. The next page. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He who who is holy. He who is true. He who has the seven has the key of David and who hold and who opens the door. No one can shut and shuts and no one can open. He is the Amen. He is the faithful and true witness. He is the beginning of the redemption of God. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. He is the holy Lord, holy and true. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the king of the saints. He is the word of God. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the bright and morning star. He is the Lord Jesus, and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the book of Revelation. You find Jesus all through each of the chapters, and you'll find him. If you do, if you book, if you read the book of Revelation and you don't see Jesus, you need to read it again uh, because he's there. Now, let me take you on a trip to the island of Patmos. I took you there last week uh, on, on, by picture on the trips that I, I took there. But this time, not my pictures, but 
One Sunday morning, John saw Jesus. And what he saw, he recorded. And what he recorded has tantalized Christians for the last 2,000 years. Picture the scene with me. Not at the beach that I show here, but rather he is indeed an elderly man, even more elderly than myself. He's probably 90 plus years in age. I know we have some here that are 90 plus years in age. And he's the last of the 12 apostles still alive. And he's outlasted the apostle Paul as well. Out on this craggy island, he's maybe brown with the sun. His feet and his hands are calloused. Because he's not just sitting around writing the book of Revelation. He's on a work crew. He's out here as a political prisoner. And they're getting stone and granite and things like that to send back to the mainland or send to Rome. Uh, he, he's working every day as a political prisoner. Watch John in your mind. As he carries these granite, stra- uh, granite chunks of ice, uh, ice, I started to say, of stone, with a, with a basket made of straw, it's a band around his head, over his shoulder, down to his back, there's a, there's a basket there that he will take these sh- chips of stone. From where they're quarried, probably taking, I'm assuming he probably has a staff, taking his staff and helping him down to to the port to get rid of it and then go back up and grab some more. He was here for about a year and a half on the island before uh, Domitian, the emperor that put him on the island, dies and he's replaced by the next emperor who releases all political prisoners Uh, of the previous emperor. But on this picture here, he's come on this particular Sunday. And the reason I say it's Sunday is because it was on the Lord's Day. And he's here to worship God. The winds stir the cattails. The waves are lapping at the sand what sand there might be at the beach on this rocky island. It may be only a number of miles to the mainland, but for him, it's like it's an ocean. It's separating him from his home. At this particular time, he lived in the city of Ephesus. But no amount of water could separate him from his God. I want to read what he says here, but I'm just reminded I don't have my notes, and I know I'm, I'm limited in time today to be out of here, but I'm going to give you a, a little story that I remember. Over three decades ago, we bought the property that we're now having our church in. And in the early years after that, we had tent crusades out here on the property. We put in a big tent, and then we'd have a special speaker come in. And I remember one on one of those sun, summers, we we asked a man by the name of Gene Jackson uh, to be, to be the special speaker, and we'd come in here every day, every night for a week or so. And uh, Gene Jackson happened to be this. Superintendent of uh, the Assemblies of God in the in the state of Tennessee, and uh, he was telling a story once. He said that he heard on the news something that the president was doing, and he didn't like what the president was doing, so he's going to call the president. He actually gets on the phone and he tries to call the president and he is passed from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, and it never gets to the president. He just gets passed on. 
He says, he says, after that, trying to get through the president, I walked out of my office, went down to the altar of our church, and I sit, I bowed there and prayed. And he says, even though I can't get to the president, I can get to God immediately. Yeah. And that's what John here, that's what I was reminded of when I, uh, picturing John here. Yeah, you can't get to home. It's only a few miles, but it might be like a 100-mile ocean. But he can get to God. And he says this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a tr- as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Notice that the voice comes from behind him. John is about to turn to see Jesus. Of course, this isn't the first time John has seen Jesus. You and I, we only read about how his hands broke the bread and fed thousands. But John saw those hands, sometimes calloused, knuckled. He saw them. You and I can read about how his feet made a path through the waves of the Sea of Galilee. But John saw those feet, ten-toed, sandaled, sometimes dirty. We read about scriptures that talk about his piercing eyes. John saw those eyes. Gazing at a crowd, bright bright in laughter, looking for souls. He saw him. For more than three years, he had been with Jesus. But this encounter was far different than any that he had ever had with his Lord before this time. And he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of God, the Son of Man. Now, this image was so vivid. So powerful that shortly after he turns to see Jesus, he falls as if he's dead. John falls at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus puts his hand, this is in verse 17 of the first chapter, puts his hand on and says, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. And yes, I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. This is not because he didn't recognize Jesus, but because the image was so different. You see, he calls him the Son of Man, and in the New Testament, the Son of Man is found 88 times. Of those 88 times, well, all the 88 times they're talking about Jesus. That's who is being described by the term Son of Man. Of those 88 times, 84 of them are are said by Christ himself. And he uses that term over and over again to to identify himself. He's the Son of Man. Only four 
times is it not used from the mouth of Jesus and the scripture I just read is one of those four. Here's an example of him using this phrase. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour that you think not. So he is the Son of Man. John recognized him as the Son of Man but something different caused him to fall at his feet. Because this time he wasn't as a shepherd boy, or as a carpenter, but he was his majesty the king. It doesn't say that he will be king. It says he's king right now. And if you take that thought, We find in the scripture, he is called the king of heaven, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the king of the ages, the king of glory, the king of saints, and the king of kings. Let me tell you another story about Paula and me. A little over three decades ago, uh, we made a trip to Germany. Our daughter, Jackie, was working over there at the time, and she's fluent in German. And working there, and we went over to visit her. And uh, while we were there, we did a lot of sightseeing. It was it was good to have a, a, a person fluent in the language that we could get around very well. Uh, but on one of the, we, we visited a lot of different museums. And uh, one of them was a, a famous art museum. I'm not so much into art, but I, I enjoy a, a good painting. And, uh, but these were, these were famous paintings. And I remember looking at a painting, and, and I got real close to look at the brass tag next to the painting to see who it was that painted this particular one I was looking at. And it said something like Rembrandt or Renoir. And I looked up, while I'm still leaning there, I looked up at the, the painting and it, all I could see was a bunch of blotches of uh, paint. Uh, and uh, I, saw, I remember saying to myself, I thought this guy was supposed to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and Something inside of me says, step back. So I stepped back, and only then did I realize the full magnificence of what he had put on the, the, the slab of the canvas. And uh, I, I use that as an illustration that sometimes we get so caught up in studying end times that we get like that. We get so close, we forget about the whole. Uh, and, and we don't want to forget about the whole. I, I find sometimes, and it does, uh, it, it bothers me and, and it amazes me that we find with every headline that comes out, some people are trying to outdo each other to say, well, this is what this means in the Bible. Uh, not every headline has anything to do with the Bible. Not everyone. Uh, but uh, especially on the end times. <clears throat> I have so much more, but we have to, to get out of here on time today. Let me take you through an illustra- another illustration and then close. I'm going to go back a few hundred years, actually about 1,700 years, to a, a man called Augustine. Augustine. He 
he puts a question to the people that were listening to him and I'm going to quote him he says I quote imagine God saying to you I'll make you a deal if you wish I will give you anything and everything you ask pleasure power honor wealth freedom even peace of mind and a good conscience nothing will be a sin nothing will be forbidden and nothing will be impossible to you you will never be bored and you will never die and then he stops and says I have one more phrase to add but what do you think about it now and some of us might be implying well that's pretty good I can do all that and have all that and not be considered a sin and I'll live forever but before you put up your hand and say I want to be part of that he goes on and says you can have all that but you will never see my face now that changes things not quite so appealing I hope for all of us it's not appealing at all anymore but some might say well what's so amazing about Jesus to see him for all eternity well the Apostle Paul felt that he was in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 he says on the day when the Lord comes all the people who have believed will be amazed at Jesus amazed at Jesus just as we are closing the previous service in here in softer Sunday <clears throat> Pastor Cal said never lose your wonder of what Jesus has done for you and he gave a few other examples as well the wonder of a child as our speaker talked about last hour everything changes when you can't be with Jesus back to the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the first and the last Jesus didn't leave him as dead he touched him on the shoulder said I am the do not be afraid I am the first and the last when you think about God there are a number of scriptures that you could pull out that really tell you what our God is like and I'm tr trying to find it in my notes here I was skipping ahead God is to be is said to be everlasting Genesis 2133 God inhabits eternity Isaiah 57 verse 15 and he is without be beginning or ending in that he is from everlasting to everlasting Psalm 90 verse 2 from everlasting to everlasting shows that God is outside of time he is beyond time time doesn't define him as this, these two or three verses I just mentioned to you and yet when he spoke to John he says I am the first and the last and you can't have first and last without time 
to say something that's first implies there's going to be at least a second. And to say, I'm the end, implies there was something that came before it. In order for Jesus to be able to say, I am the first and the last, is that he stepped out of heaven, came to this earth in time, went through all that he went to, so that you and I could be redeemed. And I just can't get that out of my mind, what he's done for me. I thank him often for picking me up out of miry clay and setting my feet on the rock, and he is that rock. And I hope you've all experienced that. Understand, yes, he is eternal, but he willingly stepped into time to redeem you. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. As we sing or have sung in the past, thank you, God, for sending Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Go with us now as we leave this room. May we never lose the awe, the wonder of who you are. For you have picked us up, saved our souls with your own blood. You have redeemed us. Now go with us. May we be instruments in your hand wherever we go this week. We just love you over and over and over again. In your holy name, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.